I just about said good morning. <laughs> I'm still got still got morning on the brain. Good evening. Good, evening. good to see everybody out tonight. We appreciate you being out here at Freedom Baptist Church this morning and tonight. I've got this morning on I've got this morning on my on my mind. I can't get past it. But uh, man, thank you for being here. Amen. Let me see if I can get myself straightened out. And if I do, we'll be in good shape. But anyhow, I just want to say thank you. Boy, we had a great service today. I believe, I believe that's the biggest crowd we've had since COVID. And man, what a blessing to see so many people out this morning. And uh, man, we, we, we could have had some more people out, but man, we had a good crowd out this morning. And let me say again, what a blessing it was to see Abraham and Michelle here today. Wow, that got saved on the program a couple weeks ago and to travel that far to come over here and be with us. And uh, they think that uh, he's going to try, he's going to try and come come back more regular because he doesn't start his driving until Tuesdays. He heads out on Tuesday, Dennis. So, uh, but anyhow, we're excited about that, but what a blessing it was to spend time with them, and uh, we appreciate that. So, but we're going to get started up tonight. You see, I got the big screen up. I, I'm looking at it on, on my phone so I can see. I didn't know how it would show up, but I'm going to use the timeline tonight, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you just really a overview of end time events is that all right and show you on the timeline so you if you want to take a picture of it if you want to snap it or whatever you want to do and uh because man you know you know if you've been with me very long you know i'm excited about end time events i love end time events everybody like end time events everybody good all right so we'll be on that tonight and i said this morning hopefully when we start into january that i'll probably start on the seven churches of revelation and i'm going to be talking about that tonight give you just a little bit of preview on that, but uh, I hope over the next three Sundays, Sunday morning, Sunday night, I don't know about Wednesdays, preach it on Christmas. I love preaching on Christmas themes. I mean, I just absolutely love preaching on Christmas, been working on some Christmas sermons and uh, excited about that. Got to get the major in the rotation here to get his Christmas sermon in, and so we'll be, we'll be doing that, but we appreciate you being out tonight, everybody out tonight. Nice crowd out for Sunday night, but man, I tell you, we had a great crowd this morning. Had a great crowd last Sunday night at our dinner, and I still thank God for the dinner that we had, and everybody was out, and everybody worked, and what a blessing that was. Don't forget Tuesday morning truths. I'm excited about, you know, I'm just, I've got a lot of passion, Big D, you know that, right? I'm, I'm excited about everything that's going on, and the Tuesday morning truths was less than one last week on spiritual gifts, and man, I just... I just absolutely love that, and 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 just I, I'm in, you know, when you can enjoy it yourself, you're enjoying it, amen. And I'm enjoying studying and preparing and getting ready and, and presenting that because, like I said, there's nothing more exciting than to, to to share the word with people that want to hear it, 
Amen. Now, if you were preaching to people, everybody just sitting there going. <laughs> of course, I'd probably just grab you and shake you a time or two and say, get up out of there, man, wake up. But anyhow, we, we appreciate you being out. And that's my plan. Don't hold me to it. That's not 100%. That's way up in the 80s or 90s, though, because you never know. Something may happen. I may have to jump in and preach on some current event. There are a lot of current events going on out there, a lot of craziness. And uh, I've kind of t- tried to stay away from that some because it, it uh, just so much craziness, and I haven't really been on it much, but maybe we'll get back on it. But uh, don't forget Tuesday morning truce, and then we're going to start decorating for Christmas Tuesday morning at about 11 o'clock. So if you can come out, be out with us Tuesday morning. And, uh, you know, many hands make light work. Few hands make a lot of work. And uh, so if you can come out and be with us Tuesday morning, and we'll get that, hopefully get that taken care of. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get the church cleaned up after that. And, and you, know, that, you can tell a woman has planned that, right? My wife, instead of cleaning and then putting it out and then have to clean again, she's going to put it up and then clean. So that's the best way to do it. Amen. And then don't forget the church dinner is going to be on December the 16th. On a Friday night, excited about that. I'm excited about that, man. That's a great time. Try to invite somebody to come out and be here with you. Put down on the list out there, who, if you're coming, how many? Bring as many as you want. Just let us know, and uh, we, we, we hope to have a great, great time with that on December the 16th. December the 16th. So sign up out there, and uh, we've we got a lot of good things going on. Christmas Eve communion coming up on the 24th. I don't have to, did I have to tell you it's on the 24th of December? That's the Christmas Eve communion, and that'll be at 6 o'clock here at the church. So we got we just got a lot of things going on. So keep all that stuff in your noggin, and uh, we're going to get ready to get started up. And I'm going to cut the sher- service a little bit short on the singing in tonight so I can have more time on this timeline. And, boy, isn't Miss Jean doing a good job? Uh, she doesn't think she is, but, boy, she is. And I tell you, I'm just bragging on her today, and I want you to know we appreciate you. So much, and just be just doing a great job. So come on and get us opened up. Can I leave this land right there? Will that bother you? i got to find the Bible verse to use tonight. Let's all stand as we sing, Standing on the Promises. Okay. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory and the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail Over the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior and my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. All right, thank you. You Be seated. We're going to get ready to go to prayer here real quick, and then we're going to jump into the lesson. Uh, Don't forget now, we're taking up money for the kids, and I appreciate that. Boy, I tell you, people are giving to that, and if you still want to give to that, please designate that on your check or on your, if you're giving online with the online app, let me know. 
so that I can let Brother Bill know that that's designated for that. But I tell you what, I appreciate the money that's coming, coming in. So thank you so much. I tell you, isn't it great that all, you, you know, you know, we're not a big church. You know that, right? But, you know, when there's a need, people, people really step up. Our online members and our, our people here, and I want you to know I appreciate that. But, you know, we don't like to beg for money, but when there's a, a, a reason, I don't care to ask. And, uh, you know, I don't care to ask. Somebody says, well, you can take up money pretty good. And, but uh, I've been at it a long time, but I don't like to harp on it. But I like for people to give because they want to give. And I tell you what I've found out through the years. Most of the time if people see there's a need or they see something, then they're willing to give and, and, and willing to share. And I want you to know I appreciate that. So we're going to go to prayer tonight. And uh, it won't seem like there was something else I had on my mind about saying before we got ready to go to prayer. And I can't remember what it is for the life of me. But uh, anyhow, anyhow, well, we're going to pray. Remember all the requests this morning, uh, everything that's on the prayer list on our Facebook and on our, on our, our web page. And we've got a, it, the prayer list is pretty exhaustive, and we've got a lot of people that are sick and in need, a lot of people in serious condition, has some deaths that have happened, and uh, we just uh, ask God to be near to everybody. We start into Christmas. You know, we're going to st this week starts us into December. Everybody know that? Everybody, everybody good with that? If you're not, I don't know what you're going to do. But, uh, you know, we're going to start into December this month. And, you know, it gets hectic. And if you're not careful, you're not careful, you'll lose the joy of Christmas. You'll lose, you'll lose. Eddie, i gotta, I got to tell I'm ex so excited for you guys. You know how much I love you. And I, I, I preach on Eddie and Alicia all the time. But, you know, they, they got saved and have just jumped in. And I remember my buddy Jess Collins. I got to always tell the story about Je Jess Collins, a great big coal miner. Coal miner. Did you ever know Jess, Kenny? No. J Jess Collins, great big coal miner. I mean, he was I mean, he was rough. I mean, he did about everything you could imagine doing that would be that would be wrong. And old Jess got saved. Amen. And man, I tell you what, I think I told you this. He drove like fifty some miles to work. He lived over in Van, so Kenny and Don Ed don't know where that is. L worked over on 22, I think, over there, would drive back home, drive back to church at night, Amen. drive back home, and do that no matter if there's church, he'd be there when the doors were open. Amen. Sometimes he'd be waiting on me. I was coal mining then a lot of times, and, and sometimes he'd be there waiting on me, I think, but, you know, just ready to go, but excited. But the first Christmas, Jess got saved. How old was Jess when he got saved? Probably 40 some 50 years old maybe I don't know and uh, rough as a he was so rough that he was afraid to go to sleep at night he was big and tough he'd fight you and beat you and everything but he was scared to death scared to death scared to death dying and going to hell and when he got up he made his wife get up made his wife hold his hand he went down to do a kidney procedure on him. they said oh Jess there's like a one in 10 gillion chance that you won't survive he said I'm out of here I'm up. He said, I'm getting out of here. He said, I'm not going to take a chance. Because you know what? He knew he was lost and not saved. Amen. And uh, anyhow, I'm back to my story. On the first Christmas, Jess got saved. They put all their decorations up. I can't even tell you. Man big enough to eat hay. <laughs> Just beat the snot out of you if you wanted to. And he took everything, no presents, no gifts, nothing under the tree. And he put him a little manger scene under there. Just like a little kid, the joy and the passion and the excitement of knowing Jesus on that first Christmas. So I'm excited, man. I tell you what, I love Christmas. Amen. If you don't, keep it to yourself. Because I do. Because I know what Christmas is all about. Well, Lord, thank you for the night and for these people that have come out again tonight. Lord, I'm already excited and worked up. And I thank you for that. I'd hate to be dead, dry, dusty, and dull. I'd hate to be that. Lord, have mercy. I hate that. Lord, I pray that you help us tonight as we try to teach on end time events. And Lord, help us to be a blessing. We just want to share what we believe the Bible teaches. And Lord, people are excited about that. We're living down in the end of time. We're living down near the rapture. The church could happen today, could happen before we go home. And Lord, I just pray that you help us as we look into this timeline tonight and, and talk about it and study about it. And Lord, I pray that you bless all the people on our prayer list, Lord. So many people that are on there that need prayer. Bless all the people that are out tonight, Lord. Thank you for each one. Thank you for those that are online tonight watching. And, and Lord, those that will be watching later on, may God bless them. And Lord, we ask you tonight, Lord, to 
touch people's hearts, Lord. More people were coming to the altar today, man. People were praying and, and wanting, to, wanting to make sure they were right and want, wanting to be ready. Amen. And, Lord, that's exciting. My goodness, that's exciting. And Lord, may that fire catch a hold of all of us and just stir us up. Lord, we've got friends and family and people that need to be in church, needs to be saved, needs to come back home. And, Lord, help us to be a lighthouse for you. And, Lord, I ask you again tonight, bless our country, our nation, our leaders. And, Lord, help us to do our part to get the gospel out. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Let me move my stuff out the way here. I got a Bible verse I want to read tonight. If you're ready, and I'll kind of kick off where it is. First of all, I want to ask you, does anybody know what this is? What is that? Swiffer handle. There you go. You can have it. No. We got ready to leave, and Kathy said, what are you doing with that? I said, I got to have a pointer. She said, surely you're going to, I took it apart, by the way. And uh, she said, surely you're not going to take that to church. I said, absolutely, I'm. it's got a green handle on it, be able to see it. But uh, when I was in school, I had a big pointer on a stick that had that finger on it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I don't know where that thing is. I have, uh, do you know where that is? I I've like been out, huh? I like that. Yeah, I, you can see that, can't you? And if not, I can see you. And by the way, if we need to practice tying knots on the on fish hook or jig, we can practice with that right there. I can see that one right there. Amen. But anyhow, we're ready to get started tonight. I, I, I'm feeling good. Can you tell I'm feeling good? Would you rather me feel good or feel bad? All right. Revelation 1, open your Bible up, 119. I'm going to give you one verse to kick us off, and then I'm going I'm to move this out the way and get out the way a little bit and show you the timeline. But I want to... I want to say a couple of things. I always seem like I always give a precursor or a FYI or, a, you know, undisclosed information or something. I don't know what it is. But I want to say this. What I believe today, I did not grow up believing that. You all right with that? I grew up in a church that did not believe what I believe. Now, I believed this since back in the 90s, what I'm teaching you, so it's nothing. Don't think it's something new. I just grew up in a church that they had a total different view of end time events. And I have to be honest, when I started preaching, I started preaching under that. And uh, you can have a different view of end time events. I'm not going to fall out with you over that. That's your choice. But I tell you, after, as I read and studied the Bible, this is what I had to come up with, this view. And if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't teach it. Amen. I wouldn't teach it. I'd teach what I believe. So, but I'm teaching tonight, so I'm going to teach what I believe. And, uh, you know, I know, I know there are people that get on and off the program, and sometimes they've got different views on, on end time and stuff like that. And that's fine. If you want to, whatever, that's up to you. You've got to stand before God for what you do, and right. I've got to stand before God for what I do. And when we all get to heaven, you'll say, Mike, you were right after all. Amen. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. That's just, that was, that was being funny. But Revelation 119, listen to what John said. The book of Revelation. How many people have ever read the book of Revelation? I'm not going to look. How many people have read it more than once? Man, I have read it multitudes of times, and, and uh, I love the book of Revelation. If you don't understand this part of, the, of Revelation, you're not going to understand Revelation at all. Revelation 119 says this. Write the things which thou hast seen... Now, this is Jesus talking to John on the Isle of Patmos. This was about 96 A.D. John had been with Jesus all those years and had served the Lord and had ministered and preached and pastored. And here he is, an old man, and they put him out on the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of the Lord because he was preaching the gospel, and they thought they'd done away with him. Well, when he got out on the Isle of Patmos, the Lord just showed up and just gave him this revelation. And really the revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Some people get the book of Revelations out of order. Can I say that to you starting out? They don't take it chronologically. You know what I mean by chronologically? That means like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, not 1, 7, 6, 5, 2, 3, 19, 17, 15, 16, 4, 3. They take it chronologically as it falls. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. There's an outline to the book of Revelation. If you don't understand this, you will not understand Revelation. I was as confused as a termite in a yo-yo before I came to this. Once it came to this and it all clicked, I said, wow, I understand that. 
I see that. And then as I preach and teach it, people say, wow, I, I, I get what you're saying. I understand it. So here's the outline. Revelation 1, verse 19. You ready? Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's the outline of the book of Revelation. Jesus said, write the things which thou hast seen. That was, that was talking about Jesus and seeing Jesus and that time frame right there, the things which he had seen. And then he said, write the things, look at the next thing he said. He said, and the things which are, the things which thou hast seen, that was a revelation of Jesus, and the things which are, that's chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, that's the church age, those seven churches of Revelation. And then he said, the things which shall be hereafter, that's chapter 4 to the end of the book. So chapter 4 to the end of Revelation is all prophetic. It's all prophecy. It's all future. None of that has happened. None of that has, has already been passed. There's a preterist view and a historical view that says, well, that happened. But no, none of that has happened in the past. Have there been things that have happened that look like that and could have been a picture of that, could have been absolute, but they have not happened. So chapter 1, John, Jesus told John, said, write the things which thou hast seen. That was the vision. Chapter 1 is the vision of Jesus coming in his glory. Man, his voice is thunder, his voice, man, and, and his hair, and, and the, the countenance of him, his eyes like a flame of fire. I mean, man, the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he said, write the things which are next, which is things which are, what did he say? Which thou hast seen and the things which are. That's the church age. We're living in the church age. I'm going to show you in a minute. And then he said, to write the things which shall be hereafter. Once you get into Revelation 4, don't go up into Revelation 5 or 6 and jerk it back over here. Because if you do, you're going to be confused. Amen? Can you see that all right? I was working the other day. I'm just going to make me a timeline up. And the more I made it, the more I wanted to put on it. And I about run out of space. I said, well, I'm going to have to quit because I can't get to words much smaller than they are. If you could grasp this right here, if you could grasp that, you would understand everything. Not, I can't say everything because there's some details that nobody may not know. But you would get the big picture of end time revelation. An end time event. People are taking a picture, I'll stand out of the way. Or I can get over and Photoshop it, photobomb it. So let me just start out with my timeline right here. Feel free to walk up and take a picture of it if you want to. If you can't, if you, can, you can come right up and get a picture. I, I, I can stand anywhere and talk. But uh, let's just start. You ready? Yep. I want to start with the seven days of creation. I believe... And I believe the Bible bears it out that those seven days of creation were seven literal days. Amen. People say, well, those were ages. Those were eons. Those were millions of years between them. No, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. Amen. You realize we serve a God who is omnipotent. We serve a God who's sovereign. We serve a God who is supreme. We serve a God who spoke the worlds into existence that created in seven literal days. You take those seven literal days, and then you can see, I'm going to tell you something that will help you, if you can get this tonight. When you look at Scripture and read the Bible, read it literally. When the literal makes sense, seek no other sense, lest you make nonsense. However, this will help you. If you'll take this and put it in your brain, this will help you tonight. When you look at Scripture, there really there's three ways you can look at it. You can look literally as the first way you ought to read it and say, boy, I believe that literally that's what the Bible means. There's also a figurative piece in that that where 
Many times in Scripture, the Bible says the things that were written in the New Testament, Romans said the things that were written in the Old Testament were written for our learning. Those lambs that were slain were a figure of Jesus that was to come. That high priest was a figure of Jesus which was to come. That Passover was a figure of the blood of Jesus. So when you look at Scripture, look at it literally. And then if there's a figurative part of it, say, oh, yeah, that relates to this. I, oh, yeah. John the Baptist, when he looked at Jesus the first time he spoke, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God. Every lamb that was slain in the Old Testament was a figure of Jesus Christ that was to come. If you read the Old Testament, as you're reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you think about how does this look like Jesus, you'll get a lot more out of it. Amen. So there, nod your head. There's a literal interpretation. There's a figurative interpretation. And then there's a prophetic interpretation. Much of Scripture is a prophetic interpretation of things that are going to happen in future. As you read, as an example, I've been reading through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. That's when Jerusalem was falling and all the things were happening. You see that, and even in that, there's, there's hints of prophetic events. The birth of Jesus was prophesied. The new heavens and the new earth were prophesied. Those things are prophetic. So when you look back here at these seven days, those seven days were literally seven days. Amen. Well, I've got so much to say that I can't. Can you stay till midnight? Yep. <laughs> Nothing in that Bible is wasted. Right. Right. Are, we, are we good? Nothing in that Bible, it's not, it, you know, you go to the drugstore, and we used to have a pharmacist in our church back home, and, and I'd, I'd go down there and hang out all the time, I'd watch him, and I'd, I'd dispense drugs and mix the drugs and all that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just wanted to see if you'd buy that. But, I, but he would tell me, he said, there, there are a lot of fillers in this, you know, you get a big old capsule and a little bit of medicine, and he said, well, there's a lot of fillers and stuff that they add into medicine. There are no fillers in that Bible. Right. Every word of God is inspired. Every word of God is important. So when you read that Bible, don't think, well, why in the world? I just, I just finished up the book of Leviticus. How many people have read Leviticus? Wow. You know what I say? Kathy taught me this years ago. You know, when I read through Leviticus, you know what I say? Thank God we're not living under the law. Woo, laws for this and laws for that and laws for this and laws for that. And I say, thank God we're under grace. Amen. So when you look at Scripture, there's a literal view. Read that Bible literally. And then see if there's a figure of something in there, a figure of Jesus, a figure of end time events. And then see if there's a prophetic meaning to it. And you're going to be surprised what you'll get out of. So I believe these seven days of creation. Here's my timeline all the way back here at zero and all the way up here into the end, getting ready to go into eternity. This is why I believe we need to talk about end time events. If these seven days of creation mean anything at all figuratively or prophetically, are you with me? We've got 7,000 years of history right here on the timeline. Amen. You good? We've got 7,000 years. I believe we are close to this point right here. Amen. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that as we're going. But you, you with me? How you can see how you can have seven days of creation, how that could be a figure of the whole history of the world, how it could be prophetically a picture of the whole history of the world. It could be, you know, the Bible said in a couple of places, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Seven, day. seven days of creation could figuratively and prophetically point to a 7,000 year history of the world. By the way, do you believe the world's going to end? Yes. Well, people aren't living like it. 
We're not living. We think with the, we think we could just take all this off and give you a timeline, and people think it's just going to go on and on and on. Our government doesn't think the world's going to end. Many churches don't believe the world's going to end. Many people are not living like Jesus is coming back, folks. There is a pattern to everything in that Bible, and this could be very well a pattern of the 7,000 7, 7, years of history that we've had. You say, where are we? Where, 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 you tell me where we are. You tell me where we are. Let's look at the timeline real quick. You've got Adam and Eve. Old Testament history up to the, up to the cross was 4,000 years. Now, if we look at that figuratively or prophetically, how many days could that be? Four days. Does it make sense? Okay. The kingdom could have come right here when Jesus came. But it didn't come. Why did it not come? Because when he, Jesus came to his own, the Bible says his own said, no, no, we don't want you. Jesus first came to the nation of Israel. Read Matthew. Jesus came to the Jew. Now, the, the gospel, the Jew was supposed to take the gospel to the whole world. The Israelites back here were supposed to take the goodness of God and the grace of God to the whole world, did they? No. So when Jesus came, the kingdom could have started back there, but it didn't. Because they did not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. The Jews today, the, if you talk to a Jew that's not saved, I had a brother-in-law who got saved. Thank God he's dead and in heaven today. But his dad was a full-blooded Jew. Thank God his mommy would have come out of a church down here, a Baptist church somewhere down here in Florida. But his dad, his brothers, and them would tell you, Jesus is a good man. He's a good teacher. But he's not the Messiah. That's what, Jew, that's what Jews believe. So they were looking for somebody to come and set up a kingdom. They didn't see the church. When they were back here looking, when you read the Old Testament these 4,000 years, they, they didn't see this. They saw this. The coming kingdom. The coming kingdom. The coming kingdom, when Israel is going to be restored again to its land. By the way, do you know there's a difference in the church and Israel? Yeah. I'm giving you a lot of information tonight, but if you can grasp a piece of it, you're going to be better off. People try to say that the church today, is that rubber? I think it is. I won't hurt that screen one. If I do, Bill, Bill will kill me. People today say the church is Israel. Is the church Israel? There are people say that Israel is the church. Is Israel the church? No. No, they're two separate entities. Israel is Israel and the church is the church. You and I are not Israel. We're in the church. We're in the body of Christ. We're not, a, we're, listen, we're not an Israelite. We've been grafted in. The Bible says in the book of Romans, we're like a wild branch that's been grafted in. We're not Israel. We're the church. When you start putting these Old Testament promises that God made, by the way, did he make promises to Israel that have never been fulfilled yet? Well, I didn't give very many answers on that. Amen. Mike, let me answer it for you, okay? Did God make very many prophecies, pr promises to the nation of Israel that have never yet been fulfilled? Yes. Absolutely. You say, well, what? I just did all those podcasts on the attributes of God. I did, I don't know how many, on the promises of God. Does God keep his promises? Amen. Is God a man that he can lie and change his mind and not keep what he says? Here, here's something to help you out. I'm giving you a lot of stuff that will help get you a foundation. So when we come back in January, you'll be ready to roll. If God promised Israel things over here, do you think... You think because they rejected him, but God says, well, that's it. I'm not going to keep my word. No, no God's faithful when you're not faithful. Amen. God is faithful when we're unfaithful. Amen. 
If man can make void the promises of God, we'd be in a mess. God's bigger than that. God made promises right here to Israel that have never been fulfilled. You say, when are they going to be fulfilled? Right there. So you got 4,000 years from the Adam to the cross. These are parentheses right here. Don't look very good, but they're parentheses. That means in brackets. When the Jews rejected Jesus and said, we don't want him. Remember when Pilate came out? Remember what Pilate did? Pilate came out and looked at him and said, hey, I have examined this man. I have questioned this man. I have looked at him. I have talked to him. I found no fault in him. What do you want me to do with him? What did they say? Make him a king? Let's all worship him? Crucify him. Major's taking notes here, by the way, if you can believe that. Maybe you can get his notes and you can go back and look at them. John the Baptist came preaching to the nation of Israel. Am I right? Amen. Bring forth therefore meat, meat, fruits meat for repentance. Jesus came preaching the gospel to the Jews. What did they do to John the Baptist? Yeah. What did they do to Jesus? Crucified. Crucified. Stephen came along in the book of Acts. Early in the book of Acts preaching the gospel. Amen. What did they do to him? Stoned, Stoned him. What did God do? You would think God would have rained down fire from heaven and destroyed everybody and just brought, hey, just brought damnation and brimstone right to him. You know what he did? There was a guy standing there who was holding the coats. There was a guy standing there who was holding the coats while they were stoning Stephen. And the guys that took off their coats, there was a young guy standing there holding the coats. by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who later got saved and God changed his name to Paul. He stood there and held the coats of the people that were stoning Stephen to death. And Stephen looked at him and said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, how, you know what God did? What a way to save the world. Paul, that Saul of Tarsus who was standing there holding those clothes, had letters in his pockets from the officials that if he could find you as a Christian, he'd bring you in and have you killed or murdered or beaten or something. That's how bad Paul was. And you know what God did? You know, just stop right there and shoot you for just a minute. You know what God did? In his grace... God said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just save that guy. Amen. And here comes Paul down the road, Saul down the road with letters in his pocket. Going to get down, I'm going to take you, and 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 I'm going to wring your heads off and have you killed. And all of a sudden, a great light shined down from heaven. And man, Saul said, Lord, <laughs> Lord, what do you want me to do? Jesus said, you're going, to be a, you're going to be a witness to me to the Gentiles. Amen. You who used to preach and kill people, now going to preach and get people saved for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What, a, what a God. Amen? Amen? So when you come up here and the Jews, can you tell, am I scattered tonight? I feel like I'm scattered. Am I scattered? When we come up here and they said, we don't want Jesus that postponed the kingdom. Do you see it? Right. So we got what, you say what happened? The church. Paul even tried to go preach to the, to the, to the Jews. And you know what they said? And you know what Paul said? Paul said, I'll go to the Gentiles. Amen. That's why today the church Today, if we're going to get our doctrine, we've got to get it from what Paul said. Amen. Paul was our apostle. Right. Read what Paul said. Those 13 books in the New Testament, those were written because Paul was, Peter kind of faded off the scene. Right. 
Those other guys kind of faded off the scene and here comes Paul, man, like in a blaze of glory and he's going to the Gentiles and people, man, and the church is just exploding. People being saved. Amen. So we've got in this parentheses the church age, which is a mystery. This was a mystery. Read what, read what God said through Paul many times in the New Testament, the mystery. You know what a mystery is? Something's unknown. It was a mystery because none of these guys saw it. None of these prophets saw the church. It was a mystery to them. So we're living in a time of grace. Hallelujah. Anybody want to go back? Anybody want to go back over here and live under the Levitical law? Go back and read it tonight. Go back and read the law and say, yeah, I want to go back under the law. No, I don't want to go under the law. Jesus fulfilled all that. Amen. People say, well, do we have to do all that? Look, we're not talking about the sins, the moral laws, but all those ceremonial laws, all those, all those cleansing laws. Jesus came and died on the cross, and they nailed all that to him. Amen. And he fulfilled everything that was prophesied and promised over here. He fulfilled every one of them. Right. You and I don't have to. People say, do you eat pork? Absolutely. Amen. Love it. Get me some barbecue, man. Get some on my head and my tongue and beat my brains out. You eat shrimp? Don't you go back in the Old Testament or the Old Testament. Those dietary laws? No. Man, I love shrimp. Good fried shrimp. Coconut shrimp even to make it even better. I love it. Don't tell me you want to go back over here. Go home and read that. You don't want to live there. Here we are. How many years is the church age? It's been about 2,000 years already. The calendars have gotten, people monkeyed with the calendars back years ago. You know that, right? Our timeline is, is, is it, 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 to be really honest with you, I don't know if anybody can say exactly where we are because the, the, the calendar, you know, you had the Old Testament, the, they went by a moon calendar, a lunar calendar, only 30 days in a month. Then we got up here in the New Testament and we got over here in the Roman period and, and they said, well, we're going to change it's 365 days. days. And people said, well, but I, I believe zero, the birth of Christ was here. And somebody said, no, I believe it was about, I believe it was really about 3 AD. And somebody said, no, I believe it was, might have been one. So you, can you see that we might be off somewhere on a specific count? But the big picture is we've got 6,000 years of history that we've already had. Amen. Or very close to 6,000 years. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, this is how many days? How many days is this? Four. Four. How many days is this? Two. Two. I'm not very good, Dennis, at math. But I can cipher up, I'm like Jethro, I can cipher up four plus two. And I can tell you that's six. And I can tell you what God did back here on the seventh day, what God did. He finished his work. And on the seventh day, he rested. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, there remaineth a day of rest to the people of God. So here we are. You read me four days, 4,000 years, two days, 2,000 years. So the next scheduled event on God's time clock is this right here, the rapture of the church. You read that? You read, we're going to be talking about these seven churches. Every one of those churches, you can use that, you can use this technique that I'm giving you. Read those seven churches. Every one of those churches, are, are, they were literal churches. Were they the only churches in Asia Minor? No. no, there were churches everywhere. God picked out those seven churches and talked about them, and then he said there's also a figurative meaning in that. Everything that you read about in these seven churches, you can see in just about every church that's ever been. But there's also a prophetic picture in those seven churches. And the last, as an, as an example, you get, back in, you get back in there when Constantine united the church and the state back there in, in the third century. And the church and state got together and began to worship together and 
where they were once killing the Christians. The next day they were making Christianity the state religion of Rome. Church ain't never been the same since then. Amen. Lost its power right there because it combined with the state. So, if this is the next scheduled event on this God's time clock is the rapture of the church. There, wow. There is nothing that has to be biblically fulfilled for that to happen. Say it with me. Even if you don't agree to it, say it with me. There is nothing that has to be biblically fulfilled for the rapture of the church. It's imminent. You know what imminent means? It's going to happen. It's going to, it's, it, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. You believe the Bible. Am I talking to people who believe the Bible? You believe the Word of God. You believe what God says. You believe this is inspired, inerrant, infallible, indestructible, indivisible Word of God. Amen. Then it's going to happen. The next event is the rapture of the church. Could it happen today? Could it happen a thousand years ago? I mean, it could have. Paul looked for it. Paul looked for it. He, th he said, man, listen, he wasn't expecting to fly himself. Today, you said, well then, well then, preacher, if you said Paul looked for it a thousand years, two th Paul looked for it 2,000 years ago. As soon as he went back, Jesus went back, they started looking for him to come again. That was their hope. You said, well, if that's been the case, I've heard that all my life. And people said that, preachers have said that. Then what makes you so sure that we're living right here on this timeline? We're bumping this timeline. We're in the seventh church of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, which is the Laodicean church, which is, which is the cold, indifferent, lukewarm church that Jesus said, I'm standing at the door, knocking, trying to get in, and you won't even let me in. So he said, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to spit you out, I'm going to spew you out. Is that where we are today? Is the church... Is the church lukewarm today? Yes. Absolutely. Is the church like it was? And we go through those seven churches. You the church of Philadelphia, which was the sixth church, that's when revivals were sweeping the world. I mean, Moody and Wesley. And those, I mean, the world was, re revivals were everywhere. When have you been in a good revival? When have you heard about a good revival? Now, we still have personal revival. We could still have, I think we're trying to, we're, Major, we're trying to get a little revival here. Amen. I don't know about no worldwide revival. So, if we're living this close, in the seventh church, after the seventh church in chapter 3 closes, Revelation 4 opens up with, come up hither. Amen. Now, I don't you know what the rapture means, but it means come up. That's a picture and a type of John being raptured out. John was a picture and a type, figuratively, of the entire church age. And Jesus took him out and caught him up and said, let me show you what's going on. Let me show you what's going to happen down the road. And then from chapter 4 on, we see all this stuff right here. Man, i got so much I want to say. You said, well, why do you think we're that close? And if, if 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, Paul thought they were that close. Because we're seeing things happen today that 40 or 50 years ago people didn't even, couldn't even comprehend. Are we seeing a, or, let me show you something. Are we seeing a new world order come into being? Yes. Oh, yeah, all, all the presidents and government people talking about a new world order. Are we seeing a one world religion form? Chrislam. They just got together. They just got together the day over there to, at, on Mount Sinai with the new commandments of, of globalism and, and, and save the planet. Islams and Muslims and Buddhists and Christians and this and that all together. Are we seeing that new that one world religion? Are we seeing a one world economic system come together? Yeah, they're, 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 they give, they've got like a practice going on now. Let's see if we can go into this big currency and this online stuff, all this online stuff. Here's why we're so close to the rapture. The new world order 
the one world church, the one world government, the one world economic system, all happens in this. Those are not things that happen over here. Those are things that happen here. The mark of the beast. Notice what I got there. During the tribulation, you got 21 judgments of God, Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, mark of the beast, battle of Armageddon. All those things take place right here in that seven-year tribulation period. That you don't want to be here. Exactly. I don't know who said that, but whoever said it is absolute truth. You don't want to be here. Hey, 50 years ago, they talked about a new world. That was a, a, a scam. 50 years ago, you know, when the, when the United Nations came, the League of Nations, I wish Nico was here. Nico would tell you when the League of Nations started. When did it start? Ah! When did the League of Nations start? Wasn't it Wilson? After World War One. Then after World War II, we got not the League of Nations, we got the United Nations. Thank you. Now you're learning. I'm learning you something right there. I feel like I'm back in the hollers of West Virginia. I'm learning you something. So we're seeing all those things take place. The United Nations. Man, if that's not setting the stage for one world. They're, they're, listen, they're, do you know how powerful those folks are? They're everywhere. So you're seeing all those things that we're seeing today. We're, we're right here. I mean, we're bumping this timeline. And we're seeing the rumblings. We better get off the lake, Big D. I hear thunder. When you hear thunder, what's going to happen? There's a storm coming. We're hearing the rumblings. We're hearing the rumblings of the seven-year tribulation right now while we're still in the church age, which means we got if we're, everything. The mark of the beast. I wish I had about three hours. You've already been, you have already been programmed if you get left behind to accept the mark of the beast. I don't care what anybody tells you, the Bible's crystal clear. If we get raptured out of here tonight and you're left behind and the Satan and the Antichrist comes along and says, you've got to have this mark before you buy or sell and you take it, you've just signed your eternal damnation. There is no possible way you can be saved if you take the mark of the beast. I'm going to hurt your feelings. You say, I wouldn't take it. Yes, you would. You took the jab. Am I right? You took the jab. Some of you took it two or three times. Some of you had every booster and you can get. You know what that, you know what that was? Can I tell can I be I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, I'm trying to help you. That was a precursor. It was a precursor to this guy right here. They are programming. So whatever the government says, you just fall in line and say, oh, yes, sir, I'm going to do that. I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I, I told you Wednesday night. Wasn't it Wednesday night I told you that? Hey, or was it was on the program. They have now said now, people that have had all the shots and all the boosters now have more deaths. I'm going to let you in on a secret. I suspected that from the beginning. And if you took the boosters and the shots and you ain't dead yet, you need to put both hands up and say, thank God I ain't died yet. Because what they're, listen, what, I don't want to get on that. They're programming you. So when the government says, you got to wear a mask. You can't go, you say, I wouldn't, I would take the mark. You wore a mask. Or you go to Publix. You go to Walmart, I struggle. Hey, you can't go, you gotta have a mask on, you can't go into Walmart. People say, I wouldn't take the mark of the bit. Foot, you wouldn't take it. People be lined up saying, Give me the jab, put it all over me. I'll take it. If that's what I gotta do to live and survive and have milk and bread and feed my family, give it to me. It's exactly what the government did to us 
in the last three years. Amen. Amen. I'm just telling you the truth. So you got all these things that are happening right here that we're seeing the one world government, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast. People are saying, well, we're in the battle of Armageddon. No, we're not in the battle of Armageddon. That's, that doesn't happen to the end of this seven-year tribulation over here. That's why I say the rapture of the church could happen. I'm shocked it hadn't already happened. I'll just be honest with you. When you look at what people, the mockery and the way they run God down and they curse God, it's a wonder he hadn't already come back. If I was God, I'd just slapped them all off the face of the earth and said, there, go to hell. That's what I'd have done. I'm just going to be honest with you. Somebody stand and shake their fist in your face. And say, if there's a God, you come to Well, I'd have just said, be like going out and stepping on fire ants. <laughs> Taking the water hose. Here, I'll show you. But God is a God of love Amen. and mercy. And you know what he wants? Yes. He wants everybody that he possibly can to be saved. I'm going to tell you what I believe. We're waiting on the final ones to get in right now. Right. Yeah. I believe there's a number. Major, I believe there's a number. Yes. I believe God knows. Can I get an amen of the sovereignty of God? I believe God knows everybody that's going to be saved. Amen. And when that last person gets in, We're out of here. Amen. You, want to, you want to get to heaven? You want the rapture to come? Get out and get as many people as you can saved. Right. Maybe you'll get the last one. After the rapture of the church, we enter into the tribulation, seven-year tribulation. And that'll last seven years. That's the seventh, the seven years of Daniel's prophecy and Daniel chapter 9. While Daniel was praying, the angel came down and gave him a prophecy of 490 weeks which were weeks were sevens. Those are seven, actually those are seven years. 490 times that puts you up 490 weeks. We've already had 483 to right here. No, yeah, 483 to right here. When God stopped the time, he stopped counting on Israel. God told, told Daniel through the angel, said there are determined upon my people 490 weeks. From the time they come back out of Babylon, it started, that time clock started, to the coming of Jesus riding into Jerusalem was 483 weeks. You say, well, we got seven more to go. Exactly. Guess where they are? They're not in these parentheses right here. Because... You know what a stopwatch is? God said, I'm going to stop the count right there because you have rejected my son. Therefore, I'm going to place the church in here. We're going to get as many people as we can. Whosoever, anybody wants to get saved because anybody can. Amen. And then I'm going to take you out of there and then I'm going to finish up the seven-year tribulation. I'm going to pour 21 judgments of God out on an unbelieving world. You're going to have the Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet killing everybody they can kill. And then you're going to have the judgments of God falling on the unsaved people in the world. Ain't nothing you want to be anywhere around. Amen. You say, what's going to happen then? Well, at the end, at the end of this seven-year period here, that's going to make the 490 weeks. Remember, we had 483 over here when God says start counting when you go back and begin the walls, build the walls, Nehemiah went back, read Nehemiah, the decree to go back and build the walls would be 490 years, 483 years took it to the coming of Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem on that donkey. And they killed him. And when they killed him, God went, Israel, you have been set aside. Can, can, people, can Jews be saved today? How are they saved? Saved the same way you and I are saved. But there's still a seven-year period of time, that one more week to make 490 years to be completed right here during this tribulation period. At the end of that, and I'm going to hurry. Can you give me just a minute or two? When we get to the end of the seven-year tribulation, 
Satan is going to have all the armies of the world gathered together to come against Israel. That's what he's wanted. That, that's what he's wanted is the nation of Israel. He's an imitator. He wants to be worshipped as God. He's going to come on the scene right here after the rapture of the church and he's going to say, he's going to make a peace treaty. We, we, the, the Muslims and the Israelis are now talking about, they're trying to get along to build a temple and all this. Man, that's prophetic. I don't trust anything a Muslim does. I'm sorry. Trust anything a Muslim does. I, I, I'm, that, you said that sound, it's, I, don't know, I don't want any part of that. They're going, they're, and they're going to form a peace treaty? It's all falling into this right here. At the end of that seven-year period, when it looks like Satan has won. Remember, I read you the verse of the day that Satan's going to be able to make war against the saints and overcome them during the tribulation. He cannot overcome us in the church age. He has no power to take your salvation. He has no power to kill you. He has no power to destroy you. He can only do what you let him do. Ain't going to be like that right here. They're going to be able to make war against the saints and overcome them because we're going to be gone. And those who are getting saved along the way in the tribulation, man, they're just going to, listen, it's going to be a mess because Satan's going to be after them to take their head off. People say, well, I think I'll just wait and get saved in the tribulation. Really? You won't even come to church now. People say, I'm going to get saved during the trip. You won't even come to church. People won't even come to church now when it's free. Nobody's standing at the door out there saying, I'm going to shoot you if you go in. When the wrong person comes in, they might get shot out that way. There ain't nobody out there with a gun saying, we're going to shoot you if you go in. And you're going to get saved in the tribulation? Oh, come on. If you believe that, i got some property to sell you. End of, the, end of that, Satan's going to be gathered against the nation of Israel. And he's going to think, I'm finally done. Because in the middle of this, there's a three and a half, there's a three and a half years and a three and a half years. Three and a half and three and a half makes seven. In the middle of the three and a half years, Satan's going to go into the temple that's going to be built. The Antichrist is going to go in, and he's going to sit down in Israel on the throne and say, I am God. So he's going to have all the world following him with the exception of those who are getting saved along the way that he can't kill. And right here, when he's converged on the nation, it's, a spe I wish I'd, it's just a speck on the map. Compared to the world, it's a speck on the map. Right. And Satan says, I've got it. It's mine. I knew I could do it. And he's got all the armies of the world going to follow him, and they surround Israel. And waiting on, waiting on the Antichrist to blow the sound and say, we're going to charge. All of a sudden, Revelation 19 opens up Amen. and says the heaven opens again. Yeah. And somebody steps, I'm about to get happy, and somebody steps out of heaven coming back to this earth on a white horse whose name is called the Word of God, whose vesture is dipped in blood, who has on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And he said, I'll see you. I'll show you what's going to happen. Amen. And he comes back right here and yes. destroys Satan, yes. the Antichrist, the false prophet, Amen. and all the armies of the world. Yes. And he says, now, I'm going to show you who God is. And he's going to go in, and he's going to sit down here in Jerusalem, Jesus is, and reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem. Amen. Satan was going to do that, and Antichrist was going to do that, and they said, I'm God. Jesus said, let me show you who God is. I'll show you God. You want to see God? I'm going to show you who God is. And he's going to sit down, and he's going to rule and reign. Then we're going to be, then for all my friends that get all worked up, then we're going to be a theocracy. We're going to be a theocracy. And when somebody steps out of line, Jesus is going to deal with it. Bang. There ain't going to be none of these crooked courts. Not going to be no bought off juries. When somebody steps out of line, because there will be people born 
that come in, come in here. There'll be people coming in here with a natural body who survived this tribulation, who are saved, and they'll come in here, and in a thousand years, imagine what's going to happen as they replenish, and people are born, and there are going to be people that are going to be born and raised up as not saved. And they're not going to follow you. So surely everybody follow Jesus. He's on the throne. You won't follow me sitting in your heart. People got so many cra- You won't even follow Jesus. And he's in your heart. People still rebel. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. They only two of them. Am I right? I got to get this in. These two events are different. Oh, man, I mean, there are like 15, 17, 18 ways that the rapture and the second coming, they're not the same. And that's where people get to say, well, well, I think the rapture, it's all, the, it's all the same thing. No, they're separated by seven years. Jesus comes back right here to get us. He's not coming back to earth. He's coming in the clouds, in the air to take us up. Amen. When he comes back at Revelation 19, he's coming back and stepping foot on this earth and say, it's mine. I created it. I made it. I've got the title deed to it right here, and she is mine, every bit of it. So he's going to come back right here, and we're going to have a 1,000 years. I wish I could tell you, when we go up, the church goes up, we're going to go through the judgment seat of Christ. That means you're going to stand in judgment for the way you've lived your Christian life, the way, not for salvation, but for your service. He said, it doesn't matter. Then get, get saved, live any way you want. You've forgotten about this right here. You forgot that there's a... Judgment seat of Christ that you're going to give an account for the way you've lived for Jesus. Amen. Revelation 19, Jesus coming back. Wow. Thousand year kingdom on earth. I didn't put it in here, but there's a great white throne judgment that goes right here. Revelation 20. Get down to the end. There's a great white throne judgment where every unsaved individual that's ever lived is going to stand before Almighty God. And they're going to be sentenced to the lake of fire forever and ever. At the thousand year end of this kingdom on earth. We're just transitioning right into eternity. We're going right on into eternity. Revelation 21, 22. Read it. New heavens and new earth. I mean, it's plain as no. Once you can, if you can, let me say again, if you can grasp any of this right here. And I know, and I know it's tough. I don't know if you haven't really looked at it and haven't studied it. Maybe you're confused as a termite and a yo-yo, and I, I don't want you to be because I want you to know what's going on in the world and biblically, from a biblical perspective. And if you can get that, you can say, oh, right there's where we are. Yes, the rapture's next, seven-year tribulation, second coming to Jesus, thousand-year reign on earth, then we're going into eternity. And it's going to be great. You don't want to miss you don't want to miss Jesus. Man, you don't want to be lost. You don't want to be left behind. You want to make sure. You want to make sure. Can I throw Doug out under the bus for a minute tonight? Sure. Doug is a member of our church. Amen. And today Doug came forward all to call. And I said, Doug, what is it, buddy? What what can I do? What do you need? And he said, I just want to make sure. Amen. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. I would rather make sure and know Amen. than to wait until you die or you're left behind and say, uh-oh, Amen. I've been playing games or I wasn't really ready. Uh-oh. That sounded like me on there. Hey, that's, hey, again, I'm going to close. Me and get a song of invitation. I hope you've gotten something out of this. Get a picture of it. Come back. It gets you a good picture of it. Look at that thing. Take this thing. When I was in the classroom teaching civics, I had a great big whiteboard. Now, you old folks don't know what a whiteboard is. They used to call them blackboards. We had to write on with chalk and clean the dusters and the erasers and all that stuff. Now they've got what they call whiteboards. They're white, and they're magnetic, and you write on them with dry erase markers. And I had a great big one on my back wall, and I put a timeline on there from history of way back, way back, going back into England, all the way up into the Civil War. And I'd take that stuff, and I'd make things, and I'd stick them, and sometimes I'd mangle them and put them out of order. And I'd say, you go put them up or where they go. 
You go put them up where they go. Put them in the right order. And I love to. I could take that and teach. As you can tell, I'll probably teach forever, it seems like. Because there's so much on that. Amen. If you can just grasp some of the key points of that. Wow, how much better your Christian life is going to be. You say, preacher, is it that important to teach on end time events? My wife will tell you. Every time we've ever taught on end time events coming through our ministry, we've seen people get excited about Jesus. Man, it'll excite you. It either excites you or gets you saved and gets you right. Amen. It'll make you realize, man, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want my family to die lost. I don't want my people to die lost. I want everybody to go with me. Because you don't want anybody, you don't want your worst enemy to be right here. More or less your family. And then somebody look at you and say, you never told me about Jesus. You said you love me. You said you cared about me. But yet you never told me about Jesus. Guys, this is important stuff. It's just sing a verse. If you need to pray, come on and pray. If you need to be saved, tell me. Let's get, it, let's get that thing settled right here tonight, man. Let's take care of it. Amen. And we'll get ready to go home. Thank you. You've been such a great crowd tonight. Mimo, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Everybody ought to be here tonight, by the way, at this altar. Everybody, by, only two types of people ought to be up here praying tonight. Those who need to and those who don't need to. Because every one of you got somebody lost and unsaved in your family that you ought to be right there bombarding the throne of grace and saying, dear God, save my people before it's too late. Let's sing. Let's sing. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds as music in my ear, the sweetest name, sweetest on, name earth. on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Appreciate you. Listen, I don't know everything about the Bible. I'm going to say this. I hope it doesn't sound bad. Some of the parts I do know, I know pretty good. I know this right here. I can tell you about end time events. Now, you might not believe it. You may not agree with it. And that's fine. That's your decision. Big D, I don't know it all. Not, I don't only know about that much, but the parts I do, hey, Major, the parts I do know, Amen. I know pretty good. Yes. And that's one of them that I know pretty good, and I thank God for that, that he has allowed me to understand that and to teach that. So I look forward to, I look forward to January, those seven churches. Man, you don't yes. want to miss that. Yes. You want to be here. Amen. God bless you. Major, find a mic if you can. Right. If not, I'll give you this one. All right, what a, what a message, amen. amen? Love that. That'll get you excited, man. Get you excited, get you ready. Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come today, Lord, we thank you for the message that we heard, dear Lord, on end times and go through this timeline, dear Lord. And we just thank you for, for Dad and anointing him, dear Lord, and thank you for everyone that's here and everyone that's online, dear Lord. Pray, help us, dear Lord, to have a, have a conviction in our heart, dear Lord, to want to get out to our, our lost friends and our lost family, our lost neighbors, and those people we come in contact with, Lord. Help us to, to tell them about you, Lord, cause, because we know that uh, the end is near, Father, and help us, to, help us to make sure that we want to get as many people ready as we can for your coming, Father, and for, for the rapture. 
rapture. Because we know it's going to be a terrible time on earth, dear Lord, during the tribulation, Father. We don't want anybody to be here for that, dear Lord. But help us to help us to do everything we can, Father. And help us keep us safe as we go out of here, dear Lord. And bring us back on Tuesday morning for those that can make it. And then on Wednesday night for everybody else, dear Lord. Help us to help us to do your will, Father. And tell us about you, Father. Nonetheless, we ask not our will, but that your will be done. In the sweet, uh, sweet precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This mountain a few years ago And I'll keep on climbing Till I can reach heaven's bright shore At times I grow weary My steps get tired Along this way But I'm gonna live in Canaan land One glorious day That's where I am. 